Okay, a very good afternoon to everyone today. I, Proyashi Barwa, author of Mystic Sinners, warmly welcome you to this very special live online panel set discussion, which revolves around mysticism mm -hmm. of Assam and its impact on literature and music. This session is essentially a part of Mystic India Festival, which has been organized by the very esteemed co-founder and directors of Kalinga Literary Festival. And it, it hopes to culminate in a mega offline event next year that essentially envisages to discuss and throw light on various mystic traditions of India and their influences on literature, music, art, and filmmaking. So very good afternoon, all of you. And, to introduce, and I would want to introduce my, my very distinguished panel. Today, we have two literary icons of Assam, Dhruva Hazorika and Mitra Pukon, who, need, who really need no introduction to the people of Assam. For, let me tell you uh, something which is very pertinent in this uh, context. The tribe of Assamese writers who really write in English are very limited, are fairly limited. So in this space, both Rubo Hazorika and Mitra Pukon have made contributions which are frankly colossal. Uh, if, uh, it would really not be an exaggeration to say that uh, uh, the people look forward to the Sunday editions of the largest circulated English dailies of the state, only to read their very engaging and uh, very engaging and enduring columns. Not just that, when it comes to novels, fiction writing, and and novels published by national publishers, Mitra Pukon and the Rupa Hazorika have left a indelible imprint for their books have let, uh, set unprecedented benchmarks for Assamese writers who are writing in the, in the English language and aspire to do so. So uh, with the, uh, uh, honestly speaking, as you would have guessed, you know, Mitra Baido and Rubor Da, as they are popularly known in, in, the, in the literary circuit and social circuit of Assam, <coughs> really need no introduction. And um, for the ones of, uh, among you who are a little uninitiated, I would like to add that Rupa Hazorika is also the president of Northeast Writers Forum. And Mitra Pukon is a trained classical vocalist and a very erudite uh, translator of, uh, of literary works. <coughs> So, um, without uh, you know, eating, um, uh, to, uh, you know, without consuming too much time of our stipulated, uh, too much of our stipulated time, I would uh, steer uh, the uh, panel discussion straight away. Uh, mysticism of Assam and their influences on literature and uh, music is really what we are um, going to talk about today. My first question. Um, would really be to uh, the Dhruva Hazorika. Sir, uh, we all know that, you know, at times, in times of renaissance and in times of conflict like these, for instance, there is the backdrop of the ongoing pandemic. Um, these are essentially times where great literature across ages have been born. Do you feel uh, that there has been any work of literature in recent times that has captured the pandemic in its essence and also thrown light on various uh, contemporary facets of um, the social um, of the social structure today? If yes, uh, I would just want you to share your views. Which are the works? And if no, where do you think that we need to make a beginning? So, uh, a very good afternoon to you, Prashi. A very good afternoon to the August to the August audience. 
uh, Prayashi, thank you for introducing us, uh, actually, at least uh, me, with such uh, a lot of love and affection. I do deserve most of the praise and accolades that you have extended. Uh, in many ways, I feel like a misfit here, Prashi, for uh, I think uh, most of my friends who, have, who know me call me hedonistic, a man who's uh, uh, at least uh, spiritual uh, in many ways. Uh, let me begin this way before I come to your uh, question. Uh, I, I think we, we have limited time, but all the same. Then I think uh, whether one is hedonistic or excessively physical, material, whatever, there is always an element of uh, the, the the spirituality, this you know, the mystic in each person. I I uh, I would say that the sheer uh, concept of uh, existence is basically myst mystical. We really don't know where we have come from. We don't know where we are going to we are going we are going to land up. And hence, that itself, if it is not a mystery, uh, then it is certainly mystical. And uh, by mystical, I have always had one understanding that it is to reach out to the Creator. We call it the word divine. And uh, the word divine uh, perhaps applies to a good extent uh, to this uh, understanding of life, as we know. But there are many who go without the uh, uh, But on a personal take, uh, I think everybody is not blessed or lucky enough to, to, to reach out or acknowledge, appreciate, understand, comprehend, and surrender to the Creator. The ones he or she does I think mysticism or the mysticality of one's existence comes into being very forcefully. Now, in present scenario, in the present context of the pandemic, as far as you know, the immediate uh, thought was uh, the immediate uh, recollection went to Gabe Garcia Marquez's uh, uh, a wonderful book, uh, Love in the Time of Cholera, and also this all time favorite of many people, Alcantara's The Plague. But then I don't think I have come across. <laughs> Or any work of fiction. I'm basically a fictionalist. Although uh, the 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 reading uh, uh, the reading platform goes to beyond that to non-fiction to of uh, to a good extent, hopefully. But then I don't think I've come across that. But what I have come across, Prashi, you know, are attempts by a good number of people all over the world, especially in Western in the Western uh, Hemisphere, uh, to it. Buddhist meditation to 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 mitigate the sufferings born of the pandemic. I I, I know one uh, one instance of a Dr. John Kabat Zinn, the U.S., who has developed a but it is nothing to do with literature, but it's to do it an exposition, which is a which is a which is a an alter ego of literature that is the uh, the the uh, giving out of a technique to people uh, who, uh, as a as a means of psychotherapy to even boost their immunity so to that extent i would say that uh, that is far as i am aware of and i think there was a second part to your question you see i tend to forget what you asked the second part of your question there was one more question uh, like i uh, you know said that you know uh, if uh, if you feel that you know have they read these kind of works really been able to reflect the ongoing contemporary scenario, the social, you know, scenario, largely speaking. Like you rightly mentioned that this book does, you know, make a beginning, solid beginning. Yeah, yeah. In terms yes. of the pandemic, you know, uh, does it yeah, does yeah. it reflect the backdrop of the social scenario and how people are really like you know reacting in terms of the, you know, the loss of trust and. Uh, you know, well, trust yes. in a higher power, you know, and wanting to actually rediscover, re grapple with a higher mystical power, maybe. Yes. See, there are, it's okay. a lot of uncertainty and, yeah. Yes, for us, you see, on the, uh, throughout mankind's existence, there's always been this uh, attempt to reach out to the to a higher power. You know, you can go back to those days of, the, you know, the Red Indians called him Manitu. The Incas had their own gods. Each each civilization, each century, each pandemic, each uh, 
each uh, catastrophe in in human kind gave rise to such right. uh, beliefs beliefs but in the, in the immediate context we had the bhakti movement it began in the south of india from yes. the 5th century onwards and climaxed around the 16th and 17th centuries uh, you know kabir yes. no the tulsi das we had shankar dev in assam which we will come to uh, which we can refer to but then uh, as of now during the last 9 months whatever little limited reading i have done i have not come across such literature but then the fate, uh, fate in this this the, the, the all powerful the fate you know people you know it can, it can be scriptural it can be non scriptural but the there is no human being who doesn't have this thought process when he or she reaches out to a power that is uh, unseen unknown unfelt untouched and i think that is that will always be there so long as uh, man man is alive you know so long as there is mankind prashi thank you rightly uh, mentioned sir about the bhakti movement so you see there But, after uh, srimanta shankar dev had established uh, the form of the you know divine spiritual concept of oneness in assam especially in the 15th this was in the 15th century but yeah. uh, parallelly somewhere uh, you know there is a uh, you know i wouldn't call it a domination but a dominance in the society of uh, the, you know the shakta shakti kals then uh, tribal forms of worship in state in various states like for instance meghalaya where you know people turn to worshiping um nature you know they what i mean to say is that there is this um the debate at one level among certain intellectuals that you know the maybe the bhakti movement uh, at the teachings per se of shankar dev in the 15th century did not get entrenched in the minds of people as strongly as it should have been because there is a lot of um, uh, resorting to a lot of maybe primitive traditional um, fierce forms of uh, you know worship which is not really uh, strictly part of the shakti shakta kals but deviations so where would you like to uh, you know where would you say that this has happened you know and how important is it really for these parallel forms to carry the traditions of mysticism because you know unless and until we have a tradition we cannot understand the you know, understand a particular discipline now mysticism would be understood through traditions of you know, how you uh, perceive it for a for a you know the common man at a very elementary level so i would want to okay, use on this you know these parallel forms okay prashit i think uh, that's a a uh, very very fine question you have asked in fact it's a very sensitive question in many ways or uh, a sensitive uh, question from you uh, you see assam when shankar dev a uh, saint the saint patron of assam uh, really uh, prior to his coming over it was during the bhakti movement that had spread all over india assam had gone through a lot of uh, you know what we call as sorcery black magic there was instances also of human sacrifices to appease the gods absolutely and uh, uh, there were a lot of a lot of things that had divided society and there was a lot of i would say cruelty in, in the name of the divine now shankar dev came in with the, uh, with with a great lot of strength he was an extraordinary man lived up to 120 years uh, and then he gave light to a to a to a to a to a situation where there was a lot of darkness not only in social divisiveness but also in the understanding of what went by way of spiritual understanding now he right. he's now ever since he came in there has been there has been tremendous followers in fact being the patron saint of assam he came and established the ek sarana ek dharma I means you know i'm uh, slightly uh, right. using an accentized voice to you know to To, to to be away from the actual ascetic pronunciation but it meant that the one god there was there was no question of idol worship for example now that took its sway and he did it through his kirtanas namghoshas and borgates his various different kinds of you know literary and uh, you know dramatic activities he was a, he was a, not only a genius he was a saint like i said so he took in the entire compass of assam in the in the brahmaputra valley 
and show the path where people fell into place without going into those kind of practices that had assumed very frightening proportions. But then over the years, you know, it was not he could permit. Uh, by permit means to be, he could infuse into each and every household. There are parallels here. We have the Shakti worship here. We have our famous Kamaikha temple where, you know, the, we have our Durga, our Kali pujas here, our Shakti pujas. And there is a parallel uh, practice of not the Vaishnavism, not the Vaishnavite practice that was inculcated by Shankarde, but a parallel practice of Shaktism here where uh, people uh, seem to be more inured with it, they are more ha they are happier with it. Perhaps, you know, sometimes I feel that custom traditions, rituals, they are so deeply embedded into the human or the familial psyche that it is very difficult right. to have a, a rational understanding the way uh, Shankardev had. But, uh, but the, 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 the conundrum here is this, Prashi, that rationality itself goes against the idea of mysticism and mysticism does not depend entirely on uh, the rationality as perceived by yeah. the five senses. I think we can come to it later. Rationality, taken yes. uh, rationality yes. and mysticism are at loggerheads. Yeah. Yet it is uh, through passion also, again we do it. Yeah. Right. 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 So yeah, I think right. those are very profound thoughts to begin the session. And uh, I would like to steer the conversation to ma'am now, to Mitra ma'am now, and ask her uh, <coughs> a, a very pertinent question, which really reflects in a lot of her literary works, you know, because I feel that, you know, she has this very inclusive uh, and empathetic view of uh, life. So ma'am, I would want to ask you, do you believe that now is the need, you know, given the very conflicted uh, social and political atmosphere to create um, literary works of mysticism that combine influences from different religi religious beliefs. After all, see, mysticism <laughs> transcends religiosity, you know, and is a completely unifying and spiritual concept. So, you know, if you have an amalgamation of what is good, pure, mm -hmm. strong, in terms of that, that connection to the higher cosmic uh, power with mankind, from different religious beliefs, you know, if there is an amalgamation of um, uh, ideas and philosophies, that, would that lead to a lot of uh, not just good literature, also very relevant literature to kind of, you know, mitigate a lot of turmoil, make people understand each other better? Yes, uh, Prashi, yeah. Thank you so much uh, for this question and also thank you in general for having me here in this very unusual, I would say, uh, session that we are having and uh, also the organizers, the KLF. Thank you so much. It's a complete um, pleasure for, uh, for us to you know, be hosting both of you. Thank you, um, especially in these pandemic times, yes. So, uh, uh, yes, mysticism and mysticism, as we all know, we all know uh, spirituality, mysticism, it is not religion. Organized religion is a completely different thing. And I think organized religion has come much, much later than, uh, uh, you know, spirituality. Spirituality is something that we all feel the need of. And sometimes I feel that the Almighty tests us so that we we realize, you know, that, okay, there's a greater power. And then we we bend our heads in in uh, uh, prayer. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, uh, so uh, obviously the corollary is that all these organized religions, I mean, there's so much friction nowadays and a lot of it is manufactured fiction you know between Absolutely. religious yeah. because of whatever right. whatever reasons it may be because of power basically whether it is political power or uh, social power or whatever um, the, mm. it, this is manufactured friction but you go to the lay person you go to generally i mean we all have friends we all have so many different kinds of interactions with people of 
different religions, whether it is Christians or Sikhs Absolutely. or Buddhists, yeah, or Muslims, yeah. Um, so I feel yeah. in our land, and and our strength is this uh, the the strength of different cultures, which are all which all come together. And right. spirituality, yes. Um, so spirituality in religion, and before before I come to that again. Uh, there was a question you had asked Drubo, uh, you know, whether you know of any works, whether you know of any works uh, which have right. come out in the pandemic. So yes, recently absolutely. about, a, a, yeah, if I could, if I could just put in my bit about that. Sure. Uh, sure with your permission. Yeah. So, yes, of course, uh, ma'am. Yes. Ma yeah, Very there's good. a book brought, yeah, there's a book brought yeah. out, uh, both a virtual book as well as a real, you know, uh, uh, a proper book. Uh, it's called, mm. it's by Gayatri Gill and it's called The Day yeah. Before Today. The Day Before Today. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it shows the dystopian world, you know, of what is happening in the pandemic. What happens? It is, in, in many ways, it is like The Handmaid's Tale, Margaret Atwood. Not like, but it kind of takes off from there. What happens when we are all isolated? What happens when we all have to wear masks? And plus, there was another book, uh, another compilation of essays on how people are day 50 writers from all over the world, of which I was happy yes, to be one of them. Yes. I was honored. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Yes. So yes. that had that was also <clears throat> there. So these books are coming out and they will come out more. And in fact, mm. all of our writings are going to be uh, scarred or marred or whatever you like to call it. Uh, uh, mm. with with the effect that the pandemic is having in all of us, writers need to right. go out and meet people. We are stuck at home, right. okay? We are right. Uh, right. all right, we are virtually, we are doing so many things, but we need con human contact. Absolutely. We all need, not just writers, I mean, all people need human contact. That's the way we are made. So, <clears throat> uh, mm. But that uh, it's going to reflect in all in everybody's works. It's reflecting in our short pieces, Drubo's columns, my columns. They are all about the pandemic now. I think it's becoming right, more monotonous. Right, yeah. right. I am going to talk of something else uh, soon. Yeah. Um, uh, so yes, uh, and I would like to say here that you know literature or any art form, for instance, whether it is music or uh, dance or writing, of course, came much later. Melody came before that. But and right. words came, words came much before that. Art came before that. But before writing came mm. uh, or literature came, there was spirituality. Mm. A lot of a lot of our literature is uh, you know, it, it it is based on spirituality. The first things that a human being does, I would think, in, in, in back then, or even as we open our eyes, is praise creation. I will not say God, but praise creation. That is, you know, and wonder. Right. Yeah, and that wonder, wonder at, uh, wonder at nature, wonder at creation. That, of course, is spirituality. And uh, I mean, and it's very humbling right. when you go to places mm. like, um, say, Ladakh and so on. It's very humbling. Mm. It 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 evokes a kind of spirituality within you. These are the creations reverence. of, I mean, oh. yeah, a reverence, right. definitely. Right. That's the word. Right. <clears throat> so that is uh, that is be beyond religion. At that point, you are not a Hindu or a Muslim or a Christian. You are just a creature of the universe and praising right. whoever is the creator. <clears throat> right. So, uh, yeah, Thank that you. was my, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe we can okay. come back to other things later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there was something very interesting here that I'm sorry to interrupt and, you know, ask you here and then <clears throat> Because you said Tell so me. rightly that, you know, uh, spirituality, uh, mysticism really actually, you know, it, it all actually begins at a point when we start appreciating creation. So how uh, important do you feel is it for a writer uh, to create, who is creating works in mysticism to have this elemental connect with nature, you know, with nature and how is uh, how can that be nurtured? Because this is going to be a message for the younger generation who would want to maybe write on mysticism and, you know. 
Yes. Um, so how do they uh, develop this sensibility in terms of connecting with nature? What kind of influences help to create, uh, yes. you know, powerful and potent mystic literature? Yes. Well, one way, of course, is um, I mean, I can only speak for myself, but mysticism and, of course. and you know that yeah. that yeah. The, yeah that upliftment that one gets, I get it. Uh, through, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, when you go to a huge, when you go to the Himalayas or when you go to a vast ocean, that, that feeling comes mm. to me. I am sure it does to most people. Yeah. But for me, yes, uh, the feeling, the feeling mm. of spirituality, the feeling of bringing tears to my eyes, it often does not happen in, you know, in organized religion that you do this, especially the ritualistic religion. But it happens through music. Absolutely. It's uh, true for many of us. Mm. Yeah, it's true for, I, I would think, good music mm. uplifts. Mm. And uh, it mm. is independent mm. of the kind of uh, religious. I mean, when you go to the great cathedrals of Europe or even the great cathedrals around the world, and when you hear mm. the hymns, the choirs, voices uplifted in prayer, you do not think of Jesus Christ or, you know, my God or something like that. You just think of the creator, mm. right? And Absolutely. when when I Absolutely. hear, yes, uh, Jubo spoke so well about uh, when I hear Nam, Nam Kocha, the Nam Kocha, as it is uh, said, the prayers, when I hear the Borgins, mm. you know, and so much devotion, mm. and not by professional singers or professional dancers, no, but just in a Namgor or in a prayer hall or just maybe just sitting uh, in one's own uh, little room and uh, mm. that devotion that to me is spirituality and it is immaterial whether he is uh, that that singer is calling calling for uh, uh, Hori usually the Nama uh, Hori Nam right uh, Dhubo Hori Nam uh, yeah, that's right. uh, yeah 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 Vishnu and so on mm. it doesn't matter and it doesn't matter. And I love Sufi music. We all do. We all do. It 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 goes. Yeah, it goes beyond one particular uh, religion. It uh, it reaches. It it is transcendental. And when and that is why you yes. know Kawalis and other other uh, uh, Sufi forms of music. That is why when they reach this crescendo of religion, uh, I mean crescendo of of feelings of uh, emotions then you cannot help join in it's like it's like those uh, uh, turkish you know the whirling dervishes when you see dervish. them when you uh, yeah the the uh, whirling dervish when you see them they are just moving upwards in prayer that is the feeling i get when there is good music happening or uh, good good mm. spiritual music happening and the religion is completely different in in uh, uh, the buddhist monasteries when these monks are chanting their prayers i do not understand what they are saying but it brings tears to my eyes and i'm sure it brings tears to everybody's eyes we we understand that so at a basic layer of our consciousness there is this uh, need for spirituality i think and it it uh, that is beyond organized religion it is much more basic and is it is much more higher also it's beyond all that right right yeah um so, um, so yeah would, would you huh. say something no, so you I mean, want to add or to... add? Uh, yeah, so these beautiful Borgits, you know, uh, mm. the Borgits mm. that have been uh, said, or even uh, the Bhakti cult, the, the Bhakti movement gave to so many Kabir, and mm. this is all independent of it, may be that they were part of a particular religion, but the, these, mm. these Borgits or these Mira Bhajans, for instance, she was a Bhakti. A uh, poet and a singer, a musician. I mean, not a musician, but a singer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, Meera Bhajans or Sufi music or great hymns or the Buddhist chants, um, mm -hmm. the, the they they bring to us. Uh, uh, Dev, mm -hmm. you do not you do not have to know really the religion of the person. Uh, you you he he wrote in Rajawali. The, which is again a beautifully a beautiful language. It's a mixture of Assamese and Maithili and so on. So it, that that atmosphere that is brought, 
I mean, it enriches you. If it is very enriching if you know the language. But even if you do not know the language, you know, the mood of it, the, the, the sheer bhakti of it, or in Meera Bhajans also, the, the bhakti, the devotion, that is spirituality to me. And it, it goes, you can, uh, Meera, Meera Bhai happened to be, she was born a Hindu. But that spirituality right. would have come to her in, in any other, if she was part of any other religion, I would think. Yeah? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So, you know, beautifully explained, ma'am. Now, before I come back to you with another question, I have uh, to ask, sir, a very, uh, you know, pertinent question relating to mysticism and its influences on um, Assam's literary scape. Uh, you, you see, mysticism has, has a dark side, and dealing with this can undoubtedly translate to intriguing works of it has its own legacy in terms of the dark and haunted. Because we have the Shakti piece, we have the fierce Shakti rituals, and we also have a place like my own, which is synonymous with black magic. So, do you really feel that these places have been incorporated? You know. In, not in terms of a place, place but uh, writers have taken inspiration from these places to uh, churn narratives uh, which deal with mysticism or the esoteric, which are like, you know, um, which have really made a mark or, you know, stood out. How much of it has been achieved, would you say? And uh, how can, you know, how can this be addressed at a more serious level going forward? Yeah, <clears throat> Prayashi, uh, uh, talking about books uh, uh, born out of, uh, mis I mean, uh, dealing with mysticism, uh, uh, I would, uh, I had read uh, a number of books of fiction actually, including your beautifully written uh, Mystic Sinners. I'm talking about fiction now and how the the, the, the Shakti cult or tantricism uh, have 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 led you to and other uh, writers uh, to write beautiful books. I your book I finished about a week I back, so. and I was I I think I should tell the audience uh, that being a fiction writer myself, and I also love thrillers in many ways apart from the literary value. I think Mystic Sinners is one of the one of the few fine books I've read. Uh, it's a page turner, uh, Prayashi, and this is something we had not talked about before. I deliberately kept it now to tell the audience, not so much as to exalt you, but to tell tell the audience that you have the mystical power in you, because uh, uh, to delve into mysticism to write like that, yeah, emotively, I think you can't do it intellectually. It has to be a light, what uh, or what the great saints had called the light, the divine light or the light. Guru Nanak had called it, Swami Vivekananda had called it. A writer needs that light. No matter what you write, a writer needs that light. Yeah, that yeah. inner strength, that inner glow, that feeling of uh, emotively reaching out to a being which is unseen. The reader is unseen until you have it done. And the journey itself is one of the most difficult processes that can happen to any living being. At least in my case, I feel my life has been worth it because at least I can scribble those few lines with the kind of emotive strength that I can uh, give to it. And in the synonymically, it can be called a mystical gift. The gift of the, 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 the writer, the author to mystically offer to the reader that this is what I have for you as a prayer. And this is my prayer to you. Please receive it with all the humble, uh, with all the humility that I have in me. So, uh, uh, Prashi, your book, your entire take from the beginning to the end, I'll leave it to the reader to go through the, it's a mystery, uh, remarkably well written with a lot of vibrant characters. But I've also been very fortunate years back to have read a book a, uh, um, uh, an astrophysicist who's based in Bangalore. I've never met him, but I have a lot of admiration for him. His name is uh, Biman Nath. And uh, he read, he's written a book called Nothing is Blue. I read it about 10 years back, I think. It's a Harper Collins book. And when I finished reading it, I wanted his telephone number to tell him, you know, I have a habit of praising people when the going is good, I mean, when I like something. And also at the same time, you know, 
in as much as i'm uh, rough with myself when i'm not up to the mark i have that same habit of telling people that this is not exactly the kind of work that i would probably appreciate but bimal not spoke nothing is blue it finishes off in kamaika it's a it's a it's an extraordinary book about uh, you know about uh, black magic if the word black magic is at all applicable about sorcery about rationality to about one as a foil to the other and then the final uh, the, the 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 climax is about you know that uh, the view uh, from said that the phone going on somewhere so the, uh, the, yeah someone's one it's not mine anyway so uh, the 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 anyway what i want to tell you uh, apart from the interruption is that it's another fine book that i have read but between yours and his i read two other book one is called um, uh, it's by uh, uh, by 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 mr bhaumik no bhaumik he is the one who actually is a he's a scientist who brought out for the you know the the system of lasik l a s i k for eye surgery and he started his life from you know very difficult circumstances uh, almost uh, you know uh, penury uh, absolute penury and how he reached the highest degree of you know scientific achievement and in this book code name god i think every sane person who loves mysticism and 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 wants to delve into uh, the the you know it's not a uh, proper to rich story it's an extraordinary story by itself one should read that book so i read the book with great pleasure and because uh, mr bhomik was incredibly humble about his experience with mysticism uh, that book that's the core of my heart and i not go into the uh, the final details because this is not the platform for that and the fourth book which i read was thanks to a visit to along with mitra baido i address my sister as baido uh, mitra baido who is there we had gone to the goa literary festival some years back and that there, uh, there i met a young writer from new zealand but he's indian born rajoshri chakraborty rajoshri and i we became friends uh, in his years younger than i am and he from the bookstore i from the from the bookstore i picked up a book of his called shakti now shakti is the fourth book on fix, of fiction dealing with uh, you know uh, with tantricism with magic with things happening that can be termed only as coincidental and uh, these are the books in fiction which actually affected me but apart from that you know proshi i have been i had a good fortune of reading the songs of the sixth dalai lama the sixth dalai lama was an extraordinary person who was actually a woman a womanizer a, a, a writer a poet who was a tantric many other things in him then after i read i think the the sword and the lotus by arsharya rajnish that also took a lot of you know a uh, lot of took a my took away my breath then the latest of course is uh, our sadguru uh, i bought a book of his about uh, two years back from the airport and uh, going through each of his uh, discourses in each self uh, and enlightening experience uh, one may disagree with him in certain cases but uh, where uh, when he tells us that how he got this mystical power uh going up to a hill top one day in mysore and there being there for he doesn't know for how many hours and then he gets the senses and elevates himself to such a degree that he is you know he is he knows what is happening it's all clear for him and like mitra baido said it's not just religion in fact it's i mean mysticism has hardly to do with religion it can happen to anyone and i think uh, from all this books that we are talking about from ramkrishna paramhansa to aurobindo and my all time favorite swami vivekananda who's uh, who's uh, sort of uh, a saint not only a saint but a, a incredibly perceptive human being who could go beyond the five senses and gather the kind of uh, perceptive understanding of the cosmic uh, scale or beyond cosmic scale because uh, proesi i also feel talking about books you said that we are limited by our understanding of infinity by our understanding of what is the cosmos or what is the cosmic limit the spirituality and uh, 
uh, mysticism goes beyond this. It is that ultimate light, that final dot of existence, which is permissible to a few of us, or maybe to all of us, but definitely at some part of our time, no matter how small, it is there with us. So I think uh, regarding uh, the books I have read, as what you have said, this much I can say for now, Prashi. I think I'll have to do more readings later on, <laughs> if at all. So thank you for the question. <laughs> yeah. Um, if I may, Prashi, if I yeah, may a little bit add, add to that, may I? Not happy, Prashi. I think you can do a better way to. Yeah. Anyone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, what I just, of course, it's beautifully said, uh, Jubal. Uh, yes, but what I would like to say is also that uh, we must not, we must realize also that the great religious books of all religions, and I, I am stressing here, yes. all religions. Okay, whether it is the the Vedas, whether it it is the Quran, whether it is the Bible, whether it is uh, uh, the Sikh holy book, and of course Buddhism, and so many others, you know, I mean, to cull them all, to cull them all, and the great religious books, yes, they have a lot of spirituality. It is not that they are mutually exclusive. No, they are not. And no, no, no. I think, yeah, they are not. And They have a commonality, yes. Yes, yes. And we must also, uh, uh, you know, be aware that the practice of religion today, especially today, it's really so so different from what it has been said in all the great religious books. Uh, uh, yeah, so I mean, uh, including all the books uh, uh, written by so many people, also the great religious books by our religious mentors, the 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 books of all the texts of all the great religions. They are also extremely spiritual in in many ways. Um, yeah. and Divinely inspired. I, 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 huh? Sorry. No, no. Mr. I was just saying that such great books, the Bible, the Quran, right? The yes. Bhagavad Gita. These are all divinely the Bhagavad, inspired. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, are, you you, you don't can't know just how how, how, yeah, how yeah. it came about exactly. Yeah, you just don't know, and the kind of writings that are there, my <laughs> God. How did they even come to think of these concepts? Exactly. These are all, yes. Um, and it, then we come to know that religion, as it is practiced today, is uh, uh, is completely can be completely different. Is often, uh, sadly, completely different from from uh, what uh, what we we read. About. So I mean, whether that is why I think you know it is it is important to read or access the great religious books of all religions. I keep stressing this of all religions, uh, so that we know that the difference between the practice of religion today and the what was envisaged when all these great books were written, and also uh, to all the the bhakti the the bhakti. Uh, uh, music and the bhakti poetry. I would like to add also the great Ajahn Fakir, Ajahn Fakir of Assam, who was part yes. of, he was actually 17th, yeah, 17th century, and he brought in this Sufi strain into uh, Assam. He, he was actually from Baghdad, but he came and settled in distant Assam and he married a local person and uh, he began to write in, in, in Assamese. And these are these songs are known as Jikir and Jari. And these are a, an amalgamation of uh, you know the the Sufi concepts and also the the Hindu concepts as well. And they are beautiful and I think they're quite unique. I don't think I have come across Jikirs something like Jikir and Jari in other places. And also of course the bowls. The bowls are also uh, bhaktis. Baul we get in Bengal, of course, but a bit of Baul music can also be seen in Western Assam, in areas such as Gualpara and Dhubri and so on. And of course, the you know the bedrock of spirituality is everywhere. 
in in the folk songs of kamrup for instance you have these beautiful uh, 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 spiritual songs there's this very famous song he kanai par kara he demir porin saya nashto holo dudher bhandar bazar holo boy it is radha krishna yeah it is radha telling krishna that let me it is now evening take me across the river obviously it's a metaphor it is a metaphor for life radha is us krishna is the almighty and par uh, kara uh, take us across the river of life that is uh, so these kind of metaphorical music and this is poetry it's just beautiful poetry in lyric form beautiful poetry so these are the things uh, and i find that you just scratch a little bit the veneer of so called sophistication so called uh, you know this temperament and so on and um, and this this divisiveness that is all around us sadly so sadly today you just scratch it a little bit and you find that this river of spirituality is moving through us all through all our hearts through all our souls and uh, as we should recognize this and we should recognize the commonality of this spirituality that that all of us are uh, blessed with i would say and we should be aware of it it is in our subconscious it is in our conscious we should be aware of it and prayoshi now that you are back i would like to uh, add that yes i would like to add to what dhruva said your mystic sinners it's a wonderful book it is uh, a really very very unusual what you have done this marrying of mysticism and thriller the thriller okay. the thriller uh, genre i so, uh, yeah it's uh, wonderful hello so yeah sorry i took a few shots okay I yeah i went offline for a bit i know um, i know am i audible now you are yes Sorry, yes, uh, I have to cut you short because we are uh, you know running, running short, short of time. time. There yeah, is sure. one last question that I would want. Yeah, there is one last question very quickly that uh, with which we would wrap up the session and we'll have a a brief a ten minute Q and A. Um, and my question would be directed to you, ma'am. Um, how easy or difficult would you really say uh, is the process of um you know bringing elements of mysticism in routine works of fiction you see for instance someone could be writing on uh, writing commercial fiction or pulp fiction but a subplot yeah. or a passage could really have a lot of mysticism in it so how uh, challenging or easy really is it and i would say your book uh, which is a monsoon of music when achieved this um yeah um thank you yes actually uh, many writers have achieved this and i have uh, already said about your mystic sinners that it has this amalgamation is wonderful uh because i wrote in monsoon of music i often write about music so uh, i i can bring it i often bring in the fact that you know through music it is a transcendental process where you can uh uh you know reach or re uh, reach a, a higher much higher plane and i think uh, if you if you will allow me i will just read a very few lines from from my uh, book monsoon of music um so this is the uh, this is uh, you know she uh, the, the guruma is uh, 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 she's at a concert and this is this is what uh, i have written she brought, in, she brought in the coming of evening of godhuli when cattle moved in through their return 
when homes lit their lamps, when Lakshmi was ritually worshipped and thanks was given for the successful completion of another working day. All around were sounds of peace which were evoked of calmness and tranquility. The hall full of people listened, hushed as they built up the image, adding the rosy glow of the sinking sun to the picture they were painting and then adding depth and movement to the canvas so that slowly the orange gold seeped out of the evening and the luminous gray of dusk appeared to give way to, to the darkness of night. So this is one, one a kind of a metaphor uh, by which we are, uh, you know, we can show that uh, uh, this is a metaphor for a greater reality. This is how we are moving from our plane to the uh, to another, a greater reality, a greater plane. Um, Prashi, she's off the. Yeah, something seems to have happened. So, um, in the meantime, okay, there's a question, there's a comment, I think. How can we give us sense of mystics? That is for you. Can we, uh, can we take that question? Maybe? Can we be heard? Okay, since yeah. I seem to be, yeah, Dhruva, would you like to take that question? No, I or... think that it, it's it's more suited for you, Rivaido, uh, Mitra Vaido. Oh, I think no, you stay I... here doing a, such, a, <laughs> such a fine job. <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, Aditya, Aditya Bharat, yeah, thank you for that question. How can we give a sense of mystics to our younger generation? especially during COVID. Actually, I think the best way to inculcate anything into anybody, into a younger person or even, even an older person is through example, okay? It is, it is through how we live our life. We don't have to preach. It is how we live our lives that can show. So if we, if we show an appreciation of mysticism, of spirituality, I think automatically the yeah, other people will come to appreciate it. And also during COVID times, I mean, this is especially relevant and I'm glad you've asked this. COVID times has brought us face to face. Absolutely. Every time we go out, we are face to face with our own mortality in a way. You know, we go and we wash our hands. We take our mask. We are very, this, I have come out today after months and, uh, we have had enough time to reflect and the younger people around us they also many have been affected sadly it is not just older people who are affected by covid and many have been affected they know covid in a way has been i don't know it's uh, something that has brought us really awareness Sometimes we have become too, too confident. Oh, the doctors are there, so and so is there. But now this is something no doctor knows anything. We can only fight it as and when. The fever is there, the cough is there. Symptomatically, we can fight it. Otherwise, we cannot do anything. So COVID is something that has, in fact, uh, brought a greater level of understanding of our own spirituality, of our own mortality, of the fact that there are many things around us, many things in the world that we do not understand. And this is just one of them. There will be many more. So can I, I add? Do, please do, please can, do, yes. Can I add something to that, Mitra I please, It's also this, yeah, I, I think Aditya has asked that. It's just that, you know, our connect with nature, our connect with animals, plants, reptiles 
we 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 need to reconnect we have taken too many things for granted it's not just because of uh, uh, the pandemic uh, besides uh, despite the pandemic it is a it's a time when many i mean i think in the beginning uh, proesh had asked me what kind of literature has been going on but then there's been a lot of literature in the newspapers from environmentalists ecologists even scientists that we have to reconnect with nature we are taking it for granted we are actually uh, destroying ourselves it's a suicidal uh, understanding where uh, we do not respect uh, life as we see it we think only of human beings and human beings are not just is is not just the entirety of life human beings are just one as aspect of life and it's upon us to also respect the others this is what i think it has happened to me personally i have always had a lot of you know trees being felled irrationally widely animals being butchered slaughtered mindlessly and you know this whole gamut of destruction uh, is something that has affected us not just because it not necessarily because out of this the pandemic has been born but despite it like i said it has given us time to think and realize understand and appreciate i hope i hope i hope i didn't overdo it but that is what i feel so what would you say is the fundamental difference between mysticism and spirituality uh mitra vedo again you ah sure or me Ashwar. we can both talk about it yeah yeah, yeah. Can, uh, yeah. Go, go, go. whatever yeah. little i i am absolutely not uh, uh, not an expert in any way but neither I, am i <laughs> yeah but all of all of us at this age i am a senior citizen so at this age some understanding of little bit little bit not a whole lot about what uh, life is about what spirituality is about and what uh, 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 mysticism and spirituality what is the difference i don't know that they are that different actually it in my way Maybe mysticism is something that you know mystery. It comes from the root word mystery, and something that we do not perhaps understand very well. Okay, something that is shrouded in mist. Something that is uh, we do not understand. Therefore, there is perhaps a, a little bit what we do not understand. There may be fear also of that. But spirituality is the it all this is only my understanding right spirituality is a connect with a greater entity above us actually not above us but all around us a greater entity that is there all around us and we just have to be aware of that we were talking before this session uh, dhrubo and prayashi and me and uh, uh, you know all of us at some point or the other in our lives have felt this connect with yes. and it's not that i yeah it's not as if look i'm a saint or something far from it i'm not a saint but it is all around us we just have to be aware of it sometimes and it is perhaps a mental tuning that i would say say is an awareness of spirituality and mysticism is an awareness of the things that we do not understand the things that are mysterious to us this is a very very simplistic way of saying it and i will need to think about it much more before i can give you a more complete answer but uh, dhrubo i throw the ball to you now you can take it forward yeah uh, mitra vaido i think you already spoken about it uh, i feel that mysticism and spirituality are two sides of the same coin right uh, Uh, uh you know mysticism is the uh, spirituality is a touchstone upon which mysticism is built upon i mean i feel that way you have religion on on the one hand uh, spirituality mysticism and these three are they interconnected i really don't know because an irreligious man can also be a mystic uh, yeah. uh, like you said a man who is not involved with any institutionalized religion In fact, it was Burton Russell in his autobiography who said, "Mitra Bhai, do that uh, the 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 ones who found the great religions were okay. It was only the followers who couldn't understand them very well and made a mess of things. Too many religions, too many too many understandings of God, too many understandings of divinity, too many understandings of creation. Ultimately, it just 
is just that the mystical power is given to that person who is seeking for something beyond this life the afterlife i think if you do not think about the soul if you do not think of, if you do not transcend then yourself into that kind of an entity where just not your five senses but something beyond that is also in existence that unless you have that in you uh, the 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 element of mysticism is probably missing whereas one can be spiritual perhaps by you know obeying certain laws and customs as given by the religious uh, by religious understanding or religious schools or even by at a personal level that i will not eat meat i will not be using rough words i'll be you know there'll be do's and don't but a, a mystical a mystical person a person who's into mysticism is beyond this is beyond cosmos is beyond the cosmic understanding it's beyond infinity it is beyond anything else that we probably on an average scale humans happen to know i think that's what my take is my take on the difference between spirituality and mysticism is pranav pasayad is asking a question creativity is an inborn quality i mean someone is born with or it can be developed mitra bhai do again yours we'll both say we'll both take it um creativity i we are all all of us i can only stress this uh, i cannot stress this enough we are all born with creativity okay. okay we are all we all have creativity within us uh we are all creative in different ways i may be creative both of us may be creative as writers or whatever but uh somebody may be an excellent they create excellent gardener gardens they they create True. cooking cooking is such a creative ac ac activity cooking then embroidery i am talking of these skills and you know these are beautiful things uh painting of course but the thing is we are all given these talents but it is up to us to develop them okay so it's a combination of both we all we all have creativity within us a friend of mine she has cut through she has cut her own path there was and she has become india's first food stylist there was no such thing before she did that she is so very creative that she she started this genre all on her she is now one the the you know a highly regarded food, uh, food stylist in her own right so that is a form of creativity which we never even thought about when we were when we were in school together but uh, so but it is not enough she has worked really hard we've all worked really hard to uh, hone our whatever little uh, work we have done whatever little work i have done uh, so um, it is it is not enough to have this talent or this creativity we must first of all recognize it and then we must what we say in music riyaz riyaz every day if possible or at least in frequent intervals uh, that for me it is you know i write every day as i as i used to do. do my riyaz every day and uh, others do it in different ways but practice is absolutely necessary and you must hone that creativity that you have in order to make it something worthwhile so one cannot uh, you know say that oh it's it's something inborn nor can you say that uh, you don't need any practice you need both uh, dhruba your your turn yes uh mitrabaido i yeah i exactly what you said mitrabaido but i there was you know i many years back i read a book again i'm going back to books prayashi it's called it's there's a lady called clara reeves who wrote a book called uh the romance of the novel and she says in one chapter in one one of the pages i remember now that creativity is you know it's not something that it has to be aside from your life every day living is creative itself the very Absolutely. fact that you uh, yeah that's what i mean it, it it struck me then because i was in school i think when i read that and i found that yes every every moment of your existence can be creative your life can be creative your very living itself 24 hours a day can be creative it is only when we superimpose into our structure of thinking and doing that if you are a writer if you are a painter if you are a musician you are creative no clarity no. says that apart from that you can be creative just by being a human being and a human being with 
the kind of criteria that leads to finer thinking, finer attitude, spreading happiness, spreading love. And I remember Swami Vivekananda in this context, uh, Prayashi, he said that there are two kinds of people in this world. Swami Vivekananda, the great Swami Vivekananda. He said that there is the primary person and the secondary person. The secondary person is the person who is given awards, whose names, whose name and face figures in the newspapers or in magazines, who gets, you know, wherever he or she goes, there is a red carpet given. But the primary person, he says, is the creative person who goes unhonored, unsung, unheard. For example, the cultivator, for example, the hardworking father or the hardworking mother who, who writes from morning till the evening. She takes care of her children, cooking, sending to school, back home, warning about her husband's return, but making the whole encasement of her existence during those 24 hours as beautiful as probably any great and well-written book. So I believe these two factors about existence, about the primary existence where we seek publicity, where we seek awards, where we seek recognition, and where thereby thinking that we have been creative. On the other hand, there is this creativity where you are unheard, unknown, unsung. So I I love that phrase of Swami Vivekananda, and I think Mitra Vaidu, I have that much to add to what you had said. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so good to see you back, Prayashi. Would you like Prayashi, to yeah. say, say yeah, something? Yeah, there have been <laughs> a bit of uh, you know technical glitches for the type of offline. Sorry, people. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm sure the show has uh, you know kept going in my oh, absence yes. because of you know y'all being so entertaining and engaging so uh, i'm happy about that you know so uh, and another thing that i wanted to uh, you know do we have any questions by the way do we have any uh, audience questions that are fielded but i want to thank the kalinga literary festival organizers for you know, uh, assembling all of us here, Prashi. Uh, I, I think you know. I mean, they have uh, some final observations. Do we have any good job. audience uh, questions? No. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Yes. They have been phenomenal, I think, the sure. organizers of ALF in terms of, you know, conceiving this idea because, uh, you know, the mysticism to resolve a lot of conflicts. And we need to go back to our fundamental existence, which is very aligned with mysticism. True. And I think this is a superbly extraordinary Except that they have. Thank you, Prash. Thank you, the Prash. organizers, especially, and to Prashi. Thank you so much so, for giving us this opportunity. Thank you, Mitra Baidu. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, you, you so much for getting this forward. And because obviously, every art film in the coming year, which is a needed and relevant initiative. Uh, and uh, before ending, I would like to thank my panelists because I would have wanted this session, but uh, it's been so interesting and engaging to hear from both of you at various levels. And we hope to continue this uh, vein of uh, you know exchange in the coming months. And another thing that I would like to uh, uh, add before ending the session is that uh, this is my strong belief, and I uh, and I, I feel that ma'am and sir, probably you would uh, uh, think likewise, is that we always say which case is entire thriving, live, and uh, incredible culture, literature, uh, heritage, monuments, everything, food. Uh, weaves, crafts, but before we say incredible India or we go on to say awesome Assam, you know, I think we should start saying and owning mystic India because India is really essentially all about mysticism. Like you rightly said, ma'am, 
uh, somewhere down the line, before before religion, uh, you know, the, the religious doctrines came and we organized religions came into the world, people just had a connection with nature, spirituality, and that is a mystical bond. And India, being a land of soothsayers, sadhus, saints, fakirs, you know, uh, the genuine sadhaks, it has always been mystic India, and is it? And this is the right time for us to revive this tradition through a literature festival in the coming year, uh, which would uh, place in give India its rightful elemental stature, which is mystic India, which is probably even before incredible India. I'd like you to share your you know closing thoughts and this kind of like you know taking from the audience. Then. Yeah. yeah. Um, you want us to say something on this? Yeah, it's I as mean, I would, said. Would you agree uh, so, or would you disagree? I mean, anything. You know? No, I first of all, yes, I would like to thank thank all of you, the KLF, Varoshi, for this opportunity uh, of actually thinking about mysticism, about spirituality, uh, at a, at a you know interaction like this when we are alone. when we are face to face with our own mortality but uh, otherwise yeah. also uh, at this point to actually think about it and to talk about it has been a wonderful experience and uh, i hope i will i shall go home uh, with the inputs i have received from the other two panelists you and drubo and think about it and i i i hope that this this kind of uh, event will happen again where we can all go back perhaps to our roots in a way thank you so much i have to say something thank so much sir thank you Prashi. Uh, it, it, yeah, uh, Prashi, just uh, yeah. Uh, I, uh, the, it, it was it was lovely, uh, Prashi, all the way. Uh, uh, this, yeah, uh, I'd like to thank KLF and you, Prashi. Oh, out here. Uh, apart from my thanks to you, I feel that I mean, I'm. This is the first time in my entire you know life that I've uh, attended a. A webinar or a, even a seminar on um, on mysticism. I've never done this before, yeah. uh, spirituality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I felt a bit inadequate. Uh, uh, but as we progressed, uh, you made us feel, and Mitra Vaito made us feel fine. And I think the KLF will go a long way in you know making this more uh, more effective. Uh, it is already effective, and I think a wider audience will come into the picture. To acknowledge, like you said, the land of soothsayers and saints and spiritualists. So, thanks to you once again, Prayashi, and to KLF and to Mitra Vaido. Thank you very much.